For the first 25 years of my career, I recorded only on analog tape, starting with recording back and forth between two cassette decks. I got a four track, moved to an eight track, and eventually I bought this one inch 16 track machine right here, which I used up until the late nineties, at which point I switched over to recording on computer. And that's also the time that my career just really took off. So I kind of put all this stuff aside and got working and didn't think about any of this for about 20 years or so, until I started doing this YouTube channel and thinking about Oh, I should do some videos with my machines and different things you could do with tape. And also, what the heck, let's pull these things out and see what I recorded on them because I can't remember all the projects I did. The only problem is when I took these out and put them on the machine, they were having some problems. A problem called tape shedding or sticky tape syndrome. In this video, I'm going to explain what that is and how I am solving that problem. So I can play these tapes. The way tape is made is there's a layer of plastic which faces away from the record and playback heads. On the other side, you've got a layer of ferric oxide which is basically metal dust, almost like rust, and it is magnetizable. The record head of the tape machine sends magnetic pulses to the ferric oxide particles which rearranges them, and that's how the sound is stored. Then the tape machine plays them back off the playback head. The ferric oxide particles are held to the plastic backing with a glue or binder, and this is what essentially causes the problem of tape shedding or sticky tape, because certain tape manufacturers used a binder that contained polyurethane, which soaked up water. And over the years, if your tapes weren't stored in a very dry place, moisture would get absorbed by the binder, which would cause it to rise to the surface and become sticky, so that when you pull these old tapes out and put it on a tape player, that glue or binder would rub off and get stuck on your tape heads and tape guides along with tape particles and it could literally stop the machine from playing and then you'd end up with a bunch of gunk on your tape heads which would take forever to clean and it would possibly ruin your tape. So you had to get the moisture out of the tape and you could do that by heating it up in a convection oven or if you didn't have one on hand and you were kind of desperate you could always stick it in your oven and bake it at a low temperature for about 30 minutes or so. But I didn't want to do the oven thing and I needed to buy something because I had a lot of tapes that I'm going to be doing this over the next several weeks. So I was talking to my friend Jason Kingsland about it and he suggested that I get a food dehydrator. So I went online and ordered this Nesco Garden Master Food Dehydrator. I think it was around $170. And I got it because it's the perfect shape and size for my 10 inch reels. It's got a fan in it and multiple temperature settings. It's got all these trays for dehydrating food. Obviously, I'm not going to need them, so I'm going to put those to the side. As I said, it's got a fan, which is very helpful for what I'm doing, and it blows here out of the bottom, which is also where the motor is at. Now, some people say that this motor may cause some sort of electrical magnetic field or something that might affect the reels, and you shouldn't put your tapes right on the bottom. Other people say that's not true. But just to be on the safe side, I'm going to leave one tray on the bottom to create some space between the first reel and the motor. Now, one thing I noticed right away is that because these one inch reels are so heavy, they were pushing the trays or the racks down a little bit so that if you had another reel below it, it would be pressing on it, which I don't want. Also, if I wanted to bake some of these smaller reels like this, they couldn't lay flat because of this part right here. So time for a little modification. Nothing that some wire cutters can't take care of. All right, now it's time to bake my first batch of tape. From what I've read online and what has been suggested to me is that for one inch tape, I should bake them for eight hours, flipping them over and rotating their position in the food dehydrator every two hours. I don't need as much time for these quarter inch reels, so they'll get pulled out sooner. Of course, the condition of every reel is going to be different, so in some cases, it may take longer. And now I set the temperature for 130 degrees and set the timer for two hours. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and roll the 16 track machine into the control room and hook it up so later tonight I can listen to some of these tapes. Time to flip, rotate, and bake these reels for another two hours. But while I'm waiting, I should probably go look for the track sheets for these reels, which I brought back from the other studio at some point and put back here in storage. Let me see if I can find them. Oh, those are like producer declarations. ADAP manual song books these are all lyric books there's production log song book oh my god what's this under here i got so much stuff damn it are my track sheets 
haven't found the track sheets yet, but I found these lyric sheets. People would write songs in the studio and then just leave the paper there. Here's a stack of them here. This looks like a lot of the rap days. This might be from the Full Time Family, which was a Little John project. So this is a Lyrical Giant Stang, which is Bone Crusher's group that he had before he did his solo album. We've got piles of this stuff. People would do artwork because everybody was into like drawing back then. This stuff is easily over 20 years old right here. Oh, man. Oh, picture of Little John with Tiny and Poet Trash. This looks like a video treatment for Little John and the Eastside Boys song, I Like Them Girls. Oh, here's the lyrics for Put Your Hood Up by Little John. Cool. I Like Them Girls. Oh, here's something from the BNC crew. Another one of Bone Crushers. He was part of that group. It just goes on and on. Look at this. And this is just one stack. I've got more somewhere else. But I still haven't found the track sheets. All right. This looks like a track sheet notebook. Don Ute, 1999. Bo Hagen, China White. Oh, this is Thug for Life and was on the soundtrack for a movie called Love and a Bullet. Little John and Hume collaboration. Did I make tracks with Little John? Here's another one. Oh, here we go. All right. These are my track sheets. Well, there's some film. Film, in case you guys don't remember what that is. This is how you take pictures. You'd get these negatives. Yeah, it's a long story. But anyway, yeah, this is looking more like what I need here. Oh, yeah. So here we are after eight hours of baking. I'm going to pull these reels out and let them cool off. Now, one thing I was warned about is that any tape edits that I did might come undone. I would often put white leader between songs and, of course, editing in songs. So we'll see when we put it on the machine. All right. This is what I baked. My quarter inch MRL tape and my one inch MRL tape. These are measurement tapes with tones on them that you use to play back on your machine and adjust a frequency response. I'm not going to do that right now, but I'm going to make sure that they work. But what I'm really excited about is this tape right here. It's got three songs from my Frisbee Bomb Craters album that I did a really long time ago. I've not heard these original tracks off the tape in over 25 years. So let's go check this out and see if the baking process worked. Actually, I'm going to start with my MRL reel first because I want to make sure that the machine is actually putting out signal and everything's patched up through the board the right way. And also, this tape was shedding really badly when I put it on the machine a couple weeks ago. And I want to see if the baking process did the job or not. So let's take this back. Let's just stop it. Let me look at the levels here. Yeah, as you can see, number two is really high on this tone. But I'm not gonna worry about that now. I'll wait till Jason comes over to help me set this up. Tonight, I just wanna listen to what I got. All right, this is what I've been waiting for. I'm gonna pull this one out and see what it sounds like. As usual, I stored it tails out. All righty, here we go. Uh, that ain't me. <laughs> I don't know what this is. Uh, yeah, it's the right box. Wrong and real. Come on, let me skip ahead and see if um, maybe I don't know. Yeah, snare drum's terrible. God, I don't know when I recorded this. <sighs> well, guess I gotta bake some more tapes. All right, so I spent the rest of last night and early this morning baking the rest of the reels that I brought up from my other studio so that I'd have something to play that I worked on. But I gotta tell you, going through this whole experience of pulling these old tapes out, working on the tape machine, Kind of reflecting on my past has made me realize a few things. One is I'm not nearly as organized as I used to think I was because I don't know how, but a lot of the reels got into the wrong boxes. I also can't find all my track sheets, found a few of them, but not all of them. 
The other thing has more to do with the actual machine. First off, this thing is loud. I'm gonna have to put it in the other room when I actually really start using it for work. I also really miss the smell of tape and these electronics. But the main thing has to do with rewinding. See, nowadays, if you need to go back to the beginning of the song or just the section you were working on, it's just a matter of a second because there is no rewind. Get part of that so you can line. do it again. Here we go. And again. Sing it again. And again. Try it again. Without any pause. Come on. But back in the day, it could take a little while to rewind a whole song to go back and do your second take. Or even if you're just rewinding to the head of the verse or the chorus, it wasn't something that happened super quick. So there was plenty of time to think about what you had just done, what you're going to do better next time, have a drink of water, or as I would often do, get up and walk over to the machine and act like I'm fiddling with something to give me time to respond to something that the client said. But then I would get hypnotized staring at the reels and I would start thinking about other music I'd rather do, places I'd like to go, pirate ships, changing the strings on my mandolin. The way she casually said, you could stay at my place tonight. And then I said... My original intention had been to play these recordings for the first time on camera, but after last night, I decided I'd actually go through these and find what I wanted to play. And I found this song. It's called The Stoic Song. It's from my album, Frisbee Bomb Craters. I really like this one because of the instrumentation and the parts I put on it. Let me play you some of this. The song was inspired by my mother. I recorded it at my home studio, The Zone and mixed it at the Old Tree Sound in Atlanta back before they moved to their location that they're at now. One of the things I think that's cool about this is it's got the mixture of the mandolin and the hammer dulcimer. That's the hammer dulcimer. Here's the mandolin. And then together. Just great instruments. And I think about the way this sounds, you can hear the flaming on it. It's a little looser. If I'd done this in Pro Tools, I probably would have fixed this too much. But this, this just makes it sound bigger. I like this section right here. Ah, the tones are so good. So good. I can't change a pattern. I could make love last And I can't make you see what you mean to me Now, the other song I wanted to play is a song called Forgive. And there's a couple reasons why I wanted to play this one. One is, it's the last song of my own that I recorded on this 16 track. The other thing is, it would look like... I've got multiple track sheets on this thing. It would look like I used every type of recording technology I had at the time to work on the song. I'm not sure why. I've got multiple track sheets. It looks like this one here is the original one that I started putting music on the 16 track. Then I moved over to this right here where it looks like I probably dumped it into ADATS, although down here it says Pro Tools. Then I transferred it back to my 16 track, putting everything I had so far on two tracks. So this would be what they would call a slave reel. And I synced it up using Simpty, which is this sound right here. This is how you would sync older machines together. That tone right there. So I would use that tone to sync up the machines. It's, it's, it's an older technology that originally developed with film technology. So anyway, I dumped everything I had to two tracks on this machine and added overdubs. And then at one point, I've got a track sheet here that says DR16. And what's interesting about that is that's an Akai hard disk digital recorder. And it looks like I only put one track on it, which I can hear on this version. I don't know why. So I use literally this analog machine, my ADATS Pro Tools, the DR16. The other thing that's interesting about this is where my head was at artistically at this time before I took a left turn and went into rap music. This is a very artsy song. It explores the idea of predatory behavior and how we view that differently, whether it's an animal or a human. The other thing is, it's got a bunch of features on it. I ended up getting Bone Crusher on this song, and he was all about it. So I've got a few tracks of Bone Crusher on here. I also have got Zach Velmer from Sound Tribe Sector 9. I totally forgot about this. He actually plays percussion 
on this reel. This is his actual take on here. The other reason is, is because I never finished this song. This is a song I kept meaning to go back to. I intend now to piece all this stuff together and put it on my new album that I'm working on, which is going to feature a lot of different artists that I've worked with. So this is actually going to be something that I pull from the past for my current album. So here we go. Let's check this wackiness out. Programmed by nature and eons of survival. Yeah, just a normal pop song, right? The instinct to prey on the weak. Yeah. The predator hunts. There's Bone right there. And, and me. Hunts and kills. Oh yeah, here's the uh, here's what Zach Velmer was playing. He called it a balanbada. It looked kind of like this. He just played through it. I never really edited this. I like this hooked up. I gotta play this for Bone Crusher. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. What is this song you about to play, brother? I did a video where I went and got my 16 track from the Zone. Do you remember this? What? Yeah, 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 yeah. I see it on your Instagram. That, that's classic. I randomly put on a tape. Right. And it had this song on that I forgot about that we had done in 1999. Wow. 99. Ooh. Yeah, dude. And this was back when we were like being all experimental and doing weird songs and all this. And this uh, is a song. I I don't know if you'll recognize this. I'm just going to go ahead and play it. Um, It's probably going to sound a little wacky. What but... is this up, man? Play the nerd song, man. All right, here we go. Here we go. I'm a little nervous about this. Here we go. This is just the hook. Your part's coming up. Do you remember any of this? In disguise and gangs and neckties, in the word of God, in the name of the law, written in blood, etched in stone, pinned in contracts and pop songs, decreed in pulpits and thrones, the predator and the law of the jungle, at home and alive in our streets and mines. Soldiers came, the day came, driven by prayers and propaganda, a <laughs> manifest destiny, vanquishing my history, planting the seeds of future, a singular beast, those fuckers in empty faces. So, do you remember doing that? Uh, negative. Billy, do you know how many songs me and you have done since before 1999 and after 1999? Who's, you know who that band is? What, on this? Yeah, who is that? That's me. That's you playing. Uh, I'm playing band. all that, except for the little thing that Zach Velmer from Sound Tribe Sector 9. You know, you know the, the crazy part about it is not that that machine is working, not that you got the ADAP machine probably working. The fact that you even got them session sheets is ridiculous. All right, man. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Let's talk soon. Hi, bro. See ya. Well, now that I've got the whole tape baking process down and I know this machine works, I'm going to be getting into a lot more analog adventures. So make sure to come back for that. Also, if you like what you saw, please hit the like button, subscribe, 
and hit the notification button. And as always, remember, be unique.